that. It looks like we have a number of attendees and okay. So I'd like to welcome everybody. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for joining us today for the easy way to improve your indoor air for healthier home webinar. My name is Eric Casino. I'm a member of the marketing team with Condair and will be your moderator this afternoon. Before we get started, I'd like to address a few housekeeping items. Please take a moment to mute yourself. This presentation will run approximately 45 minutes, followed by a 15 minute question and answer session. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please feel free to place them in the chat session. All questions will be addressed during the question and answer session or in a follow-up call or email in case if we run out of time. We will be providing a recording of the webinar to all attendees for your convenience. Certificates of attendance will be sent to all participants who have completed this webinar. And again, if you haven't already done so, please take a moment to mute yourself. I am really excited to bring together these three areas of expertise, medicine, sensor and monitoring, and humidification. And all of these disciplines lead to a healthier home. I am delighted to introduce our distinguished speakers, Dr. Stephanie Taylor of Taylor Healthcare Consulting and ASHRAE Epidemic Task, Task Force. I apologize for that. Welcome, Dr. Taylor. Billy McFadden, he is the US General Manager of AirThings. Welcome, Billy. And Jake Delosio, um, the Residential Product Manager of Condair. Welcome, Jake. Our partnership emerged because both AirThings and Condair share a passion for managing indoor air quality for health. Understanding the importance of proper indoor humidification, we partnered with Dr. Stephanie Taylor's 40 to 60 rh.com petition. If you'd like to learn more about this movement, please visit 40to60rh.com. In the next hour, we will be discussing a physician's view of human health and the indoor environment, why and how to monitor indoor air quality, and products to optimize your home indoor air. At this moment, I will be turning the presentation over to Dr. Stephanie Taylor. And I, just one moment, Stephanie, so I can give you access. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Erica and Billy and Jake, and I'm absolutely honored to be here speaking with this group. And hello to all the attendees whom I wish I could see. Um, maybe next year we'll have a in-person presentation, but we here we are for today. So, Eric, okay, I guess it does work. So, um, hi, I'm uh, Stephanie. I'm a mostly I'm a physician. Uh, I graduated from medical school quite a while ago, and somewhere um, during my pediatric oncology clinical work, I got really concerned about the infections that my patients were getting while they were in the hospital. So, I had a feeling that the building had a role in this. Uh, but I didn't understand anything about buildings uh, or about mechanical systems. I didn't know how to talk to the building folks. They didn't know how to talk to me. So eventually, um, around 2005, I went back to school and got my master's in architecture and spent uh, several years designing hospitals. Subsequent to that, my research has been on the intersection of the indoor environment and human health. And it's really fascinating because what we've found um, happens in hospitals in terms of patient healing compared to the indoor environment, uh, we're finding those trends exist in all buildings for all of us, even when we're not post-op or you know, filled with central lines or IVs. So, so in, in looking at the indoor environment from the perspective of, of a physician, we've learned just some fascinating uh, um, correlations. And now I work with ASHRAE uh, quite a bit as well with different international government agencies around uh, this intersection. So now, Erica, do I have control? You should have control. <clears throat> Is, if it's not working, then let me know and I can forward you. 
it's not working. Okay. There. So you might be wondering, well, if I'm not a patient in a hospital, how important is it to evaluate the role of the building or the indoor environment on our health? And actually, it's incredibly important. If you think about it, we, we spend about 90% of our time indoors. Um, I live in beautiful Vermont, northern Vermont. I love to hike and ski and play tennis, but I still spend most of my time indoors. So the indoor environment has now become a very powerful driver for our health or lack of health. And speaking of environments, if we take a, a quick trip through history and go back a really long time ago, as human beings, we used to live in shelters where we had a lot of communication with outdoor air, soil, plant material, animal materials, and animals. And over time, we developed more sophisticated building materials, building technology. We developed sanitation systems. And really by the Industrial Revolution, the end of the 1800s, unless you were in agriculture, most of us worked indoors. And then fast forward to to now, and after, especially after the energy embargo in the 1970s, we tended to seal up our commercial buildings anyway. Many windows are non-operable. And we've managed our indoor environment to be thermostatically, so in terms of temperature, very comfortable. Um, and But the, the overall change has been leading towards tighter building buildings and more sophisticated uh, control. Unfortunately, Fortunately, my thing's not working. Erica, will you click it forward? Oops, one back. Unfortunately, despite these increases in technology, we've also seen a rise in many diseases. You know, you may think, well, that's sort of obvious. We're meeting virtually. We're in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic. But even before COVID-19, we were seeing a clear rise in many infectious diseases, and not just infectious diseases, but inflammatory-based disorders, allergies, autoimmune disorders. And it bears asking and answering the question, is there in fact a relationship between our how we manage our indoor environment and these changes in disease trends? So <clears throat> Erica, sorry, you're gonna have to help me out here. So let's take a closer look at us human beings indoors. And one more click, please to start the video. So as I'm talking, and hopefully everybody's breathing, little droplets are coming out of my mouth and your airways, about 100 microns in diameter, and they carry all of the particles and the normal bacteria and viruses that we have in our mouths, sinuses, noses, upper airways. This is normal. It doesn't mean we have COVID-19 or that we're contaminating the environment. It just means that we have these microbes that live with us and on us. And you can see this engineer is working away. Little particles are coming out of her nose, that's normal. Her gastrointestinal tract is illuminated because we have a lot of organisms, bacteria, viruses in our GI tract that actually help monitor our health. And then depending on how the air in her office is managed, how turbulent it is, how dry it is, there's more or less resuspension of particles into the air and resettling. And you can also see that, again, depending on how tightly sealed your buildings are, there's more or less communication between outdoor air and indoor air. So these are not all infectious viruses that you're seeing floating around. Most microbes, meaning bacteria and viruses, are good for us, but clearly not all of them are. The next slide. One more, please. So Eric, I don't know why, okay. So this slide actually is incredibly important because it tells you how powerful the indoor environment is in influencing our health. And we now know that, so as human beings, we shed our particles and our microbes into a building. Again, that's normal. We don't have to be sick to be doing that. And then depending on how a building is designed, ventilated and used, certain of those microbes that we bring into the space will survive and certain ones will not survive. And if you think about the implications of this, 
what it really means is that the indoor environment has become like the major evolutionary force both for human beings and for these microbes that we live with so this kind of tells you how incredibly important managing our indoor environment with an eye on human health is next so here we are dealing with COVID-19. This isn't our first pandemic and it won't be our last. Interestingly, all of the, the ones you see listed here have been caused by the same family of viruses. They're called single-stranded RNA viruses. And you don't have to remember that. But what is interesting um, is that number one, they're all airborne. The, the bubonic plague, the Black Death, we thought was transmitted primarily by infected fleas on rats. We dug up the, not we, I didn't do it, but the corpses were dug up in 2018 and they are reanalyzed with newer uh, tools. And it ends up that the airborne route of transmission was the predominant one for the Black Death. Spanish influenza, we all know is airborne. And the COVID-19 pandemic, even though the CDC tends to go back and forth on this, is clearly airborne. And the category of viruses that cause these pan pandemics are interesting because they mutate rapidly and uh, frequently and easily. So as, as human beings, if this family of viruses, the coronavirus, finds a new environment that was previously inhospitable, but it is now mutated to survive in, and a host such as us human beings without immunity, then we're, the virus is off and running and a pandemic occurs. So again, this highlights the importance of our environment in staying healthy. So on the next slide, Erica, I need you here. Let's take a look. What is, as we're told to shelter at home or now we can go out somewhat, this may change as winter is upon us, what really is in our indoor environment? Because all these particles that this girl is, is experiencing by putting her hand up, we're also filtering with our lungs and our body. So we need to know exactly what is in our indoor environment. Next slide. So going back, so let's talk about COVID-19 because that's pretty much on everybody's mind. If you want to manage your indoor environment, or if you want to manage your health, really, there are three steps where you can intervene to slow down the transmission of, that, of this disease or to protect your health. One, you can, prevent, you can prevent yourself from being exposed to the virus. So for example, in your home or your office, you can prevent somebody from coming in and coughing and shedding the viruses. That's usually a behavioral approach. The middle column, looking at decreasing your exposure indoors is where we focus as engineers, architects, um, indoor air specialists. And then all the way to the right, uh, how do you actually improve your health, increase your strength so that you're less vulnerable to the virus? So that we wait for a vaccine to come out, um, hopefully everybody's sleeping well and getting good exercise and eating enough. So the, the third column we usually leave to microbiologists or clinicians, and we focus on the center category. Next slide, Erica. Next one. So again, that first step, decreasing your exposure is a behavioral one. We social distancing, wearing a mask, hand hygiene. The next slide. So let's talk about this middle column, because this is really where we think about the indoor environment having the biggest impact. The next slide. So how do we know? You know, if you think back to that, the, uh, the slide that showed the correlation between building technology and an increase in diseases, how do you know what the reaction of human health is to your environment? So to study that, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show you a few projects where we actually looked at a huge number of indoor variables, outdoor variables, and correlated those with human health uh, outcomes. So this first study is in a nursing home over, now it's been six years, where we collected data on indoor climate, outdoor climate, other indoor factors, and again, correlated those with human health, with the nursing home infection rate. 
And what we found was really surprising. Next slide, Erica. Well, at least it was surprising to me at the time. The most, the most direct and powerful correlation that we found was when the indoor air had a relative humidity, less than 40%, the infection rate was high. And when the humidity was between 40 and 60% indoors, so this is relative humidity, it's related to the temperature, when the indoor RH was between 40 and 60, we had an all-time low of uh, certain infections, respiratory, gastrointestinal. Other infections tended to trend down as the humidity went up. The green line that you see here is, uh, represents urinary tract infections, which was, was really more related to um, activity and hygiene measures. But again, we found this very dramatic uh, low point of infections in this 40 to 60% relative humidity range. I was blown away by this. I didn't know anything about humidity. I'd never heard of Condare. Um, frankly, I thought it was a mistake, but we reanalyzed our, our data. And again, this correlation came out as statistically significant. And then the next slide is another study. So this is an acute care hospital. Um, this, this study is over a year where we took 10 patient rooms and we monitored every imaginable parameter hand hygiene, visitors, temperature, humidity, lighting, CO2, pressurization, room air changes. Um, we monitored 11 environmental height, uh, parameters about every five to 30 minutes. We had about 8 million data points from the hospital. Then we correlated those uh, metrics with patient infections. And you can see here, the red columns are infections. The blue line is the average relative humidity in the patient rooms. And you can see that when the infection, the relative humidity rate was level was low, we had more infections. And then as the relative humidity climbed over 40%, the infection rate was very low. So again, I was skeptical, but our statistician said, you know, explained again and again that, that this is an independent variable. It's not related to the seasons, it's not related to visitation. This is a standalone correlation. In the next slide, moving beyond correlation and beginning to speak of, about a more direct relationship, uh, this is a study in a preschool where half of the school was humidified to 45% and the other half was left to do what buildings do in the wintertime in a cold climate. Outdoor air is brought in, heated up, and relative humidity dropped. And you can see in this study, which was done in the wintertime, that in the humidified part of the school, there were uh, specifically looking at influenza A disease. In the humidified part of the school, there were fewer particles in the air that were carrying influenza. So that's the middle to the left column. Interestingly, this group, uh, this was done by the Mayo Clinic. They also found that the infectious viruses that did exist in the air were less problematic. They are less infectious, are less virulent. So this is a really fascinating finding that we still don't fully understand. That for, for many viruses and bacteria, there's a direct correlation between how bad the infectivity is and the indoor humidity. And then finally, not so surprisingly, the humidified part of the school had fewer sick children than the, the non-humidified part. So this study, because of this amazing control group, um, begins to look at, begins to point to causation, that dry air actually drives higher infection rates. So next slide. So what, let's take a look at what happens. So as I'm sitting here talking and you all are breathing, these 100 micron droplets go out into our environment. And if the relative humidity in your home is, is low, and this probably is not the case right now because it's probably pretty warm and we don't have our heat on. But say it's winter time and the relative humidity is low. These droplets come out of our mouths. Next click. So when, when droplets come out, they're 100 microns in diameter. They're leaving our airways where the, the water vapor is at 100% saturation. And you can see, pretend this woman is sick um, and she's carrying 
for example, COVID-19 in those droplets, the viral particles are subject to a certain salt concentration. In the next click, if her office is humidified over 40%, the, the droplets shrink a certain amount, which increases the concentration of salts. And for some reason, at that concentration, the infectious particles are actually uh, either totally suppressed in terms of inactivity or, or largely suppressed. In the next click, however, if she's in an office or a home where the air is dry, when the relative humidity is, say, less than 40 percent, the, the salt actually increases to the point where the infectious microbes are preserved. So they may be dormant, but as soon as that particle encounters another human being, the, the particles are rehydrated and the infectious microbes uh, cause a secondary infection. So there's something about that 40 to 60% relative humidity that creates the a droplet environment that inactivates the microbes, the infectious microbes. Really interesting. Next slide. I mean, next click. Sorry that I can't do it, Eric. So to put this together, what we have found from multiple studies is that when the relative humidity indoors is less than 40%, we have a worse chance of infections. We have greater transmission through the air. It's harder to clean surfaces uh, thoroughly because you have resuspension of particles from the air. I mean, resuspension and resettling. And then thirdly, for reasons we don't fully understand the mechanisms for, the, the survival and virulence of the bad microbes is higher in dry air. So next click. So let's just talk for a second about this uh, column all the way to the right, the, the topic that we usually leave up to clinicians or microbiologists. Is there any way that our indoor environment actually can affect our health directly? So uh, next click. So to take a look at the reasons we get influenza in the winter or why we get many seasonal diseases in the winter, uh, this group on, in Yale, Dr. Iwasaki and her lab, took a look at the factors that make us more vulnerable to infections. And looking at all the different variables like crowding, vitamin D, sunlight exposure, um, temperature, they, they narrowed in on low relative humidity indoors. So then they said, okay, then what does low relative humidity do to our immune system, if anything? So they, they did a really good study. They, they actually did it in genetically engineered mice that were, were created to respond the same way humans do. Because in their studies, they were taking out the lungs, they were chopping up the tracheas. You can't really do that to your colleagues or patients. So they used genetically engineered mice to ask, why is it when the relative humidity is low, we tend to get really sick from viruses or seasonal bacterial infections? So next click. So Erica, there are a lot of clicks here. So let's take a look at our natural immunity to infections. Click, please. If somebody comes into your home or your office and coughs out a droplet that has infectious viruses, your first line of defense is the mucus in your airways and these little hairs called cilia. Next click. Again, Erica, click. So the cilia, which are the little hairs in your mucus that line your upper airways, they're constantly washing upwards to keep infectious microbes or harmful particles out of your deep lung tissues. Next click. And subsequent to the mucus and the cilia protection, say something does uh, penetrate deeper, then our immune system sends in the first line of defense cells, macrophages and dendritic cells. Next click. So the, um, these cells make protective proteins such as interferon. Protect, uh, next click. And then if necessary, if the infection continues, the rest of our immune system is brought into play. Next click. So what Dr. Iwasaki found was that when the relative humidity in our ambient environment or indoor air is around 20%, all of these protective steps are impaired. So the mucus becomes thick and is not effective at 
uh, trapping particles. The little cilia can't work because the mucus is too viscous. So those things are kind of intuitive. But furthermore, they found that those, uh, those other steps are also impaired. Your dendritic cells and macrophages don't produce interferon and other uh, protective proteins in the same way. Um, so there, there were many steps in the respiratory protection system that were impaired by dry air, which is really, really uh, interesting and surprising. So the next slide. So what, to sort of tie this up for my part of the presentation, we found that of all the different <laughs> metrics and all the different management um, strategies for making your indoor environment safe, that managing your relative humidity from 40 to 60% is absolutely key. And not only does it clean your air, so to speak, decreases particles in your breathing zone, decreases the infectivity of many viruses and bacteria, but surprisingly or not so surprisingly, humidity in that range also, also supports your natural immune system. So super, super important. And, uh, and very actionable. Next step, next slide. So once we get through this pandemic, maybe you'll say, okay, well, we don't really need to humidify after COVID-19 goes away. But our bodies are also directly impacted by dry air and all of our organ systems um, suffer when, they, when the air is, is dry, when it's less than a relative humidity of 40%. And I don't have time to tell you about all of, exactly what happens, but it's very uh, impactful. Next slide. And as a matter of fact, if you take all of the studies that have been done with very sophisticated uh, assessment technologies that look at the genetic um, coding of viruses and bacteria, we're finding that the many, many categories of viruses and bacteria are more problematic when the relative humidity is less than 40% or over 60%. And again, surprisingly or not surprisingly, we're also finding that human beings do best in that 40 to 60% zone. So I've become a believer that mother nature gave us this opportunity to survive against this multitude of, of bacteria and viruses that mutate and evolve much more rapidly than we do. And when you're outdoors, in many different climates, you're usually in that 40 to 60% zone, even if it's cold out. But when we create these sealed, sophisticated buildings and heat them and don't humidify, we, we lose that protection from 40 to 60%. So I think it's incredibly important. Next slide. So, so I've, I've talked to you about the health consequences of low uh, indoor humidity. Now, Billy is going to talk about how do we know, how can we actually bring the visibility to some of the indoor factors that impact our health? So, Billy, you're on. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stephanie and, and Erica. And Jake, I think there's a lot of great, uh, obviously, as we get into what we do as a company at AirThings, um, simply put, as we monitor the air of, of the air quality inside a home in both residential and commercial environments. So I think for today's audience, thinking more specific to, um, you know, homes, uh, everyone, obviously we all live in some, some indoor dwelling. Um, but I think in terms of what, you know, the medical community has done is, 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 is taken a lot of the outputs of our devices and formulated that into um, key learnings, in this case, humidity. Um, so I know that from, from a, just what we all feel from temperature and humidity is, is kind of comfort based, but in reality, there's a lot of science and, and studies that have been done to um, obviously validate the importance of humidity. So, um, so thank you. And, and um, so let me give you just quick quick overview of everything. So we're a 12 year old company um, headquartered in Oslo, Norway. So our U.S. Uh, headquarters is just at uh, just outside of Chicago. The lovely Midwest. So we're we're changing to uh, this fall season and ramping up for another winter. Um, but um, we we focus, as I mentioned, so we're a company was founded 12 years ago, uh, founded by three particle physicists uh, who studied together in, in Europe at CERN, um, and they actually uh, patented a technology for detecting radon gas, which we'll talk a little bit about, and 
hopefully very uh, relevant to the audience if anybody is in the real estate business. Uh, but um, we basically, have, as our mission really is to empower people around the world to breathe better, to take control of the, the air they breathe. And through our devices, um, beautiful devices like this here, um, that monitor the air quality and then be able to provide that information and those insights uh, into a, an easy to use, under, easy to use and understand uh, form, um, which can be done through a, a smartphone. So I'm going to go to the next slide, uh, Erica, please. So I'm going to talk about why and how um, to monitor indoor quality. Um, so in terms of the the why factor, as uh, Dr. Stephanie alluded to, but things outside of humidity that are most critical, and, and what our company was founded off of is um, you can see in the illustration here represented it's color coded, but uh, the red arrows represent radon gas. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in more detail. Um, we're all very familiar in our home setting um, about mold and the impact that it has um, on, on the physical element of the home itself, but also, um, you know, the health impacts of us with people who suffer from allergies, asthma, and other respiratory uh, related illnesses. Um, CO2, which is um, carbon dioxide, so not to be confused with carbon monoxide, but we as humans exhale um, carbon dioxide gas in a, in, in a crowded environment, whether it's at home. Uh, it has a tendency to cause people to get tired, sleepy, it causes headaches, et cetera. And the other one is the green arrows there that represent um, airborne chemicals. So anything that we bring from the outside, we go to shop and we buy new bedding, we buy new furniture, what have you. A lot of those products can emit um, what they call volatile organic chemicals. So it's the off-gassing of chemicals. And those chemicals and gases can live, um, in the example of a, of a new sofa, can, can live and off-gas for up to five years. So um, we have uh, devices that will continue to monitor those things. And, and obviously the, the quickest thing to do is obviously to, to ventilate the homes. Um, so let's go to the next slide, Erica, please. So where we're, where AirThings was founded um, with the patent technology and radon gas, which is still, still limited in terms of overall awareness, but um, this is the second leading cause of lung cancer really worldwide. Um, and so it's basically um, attributed to six times more deaths um, a year than house fires and carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, the EPA would suggest that living in a indoor environment that has high radon levels um, could be the equivalent of smoking 10 cigarettes a day. So it's radon gas in itself as a nutshell is, is the de decay um, from the ground, um, and it's, um, it's it's the difference between and it was kind of correlated to smoke detectors or a carbon monoxide detector. But the difference with radon gas is its exposure over a long periods of time that has the most um, the largest impact to to your health. So you can see there in the bottom left, the the Environmental Protection Agency has has created basically three zones. It's a predictive map there. The red areas being the highest risk areas the orange areas being more moderately risk, and then the yellow areas, which you can um, attest to more of the warmer climate markets are the low risk areas. Um, but if you go to the next slide, Erica, we actually as a company now with our devices, because um, that prior map from the EPA was predictive data. So it was looking at the geological makeup of, of what's below the earth uh, to determine if it's got a lot high level of bedrock or rock or granite, um, which is generally where uh, radon gas emits from. But we have all of our devices now that are um, deployed into thousands upon thousands of homes. And so now you can go to radonmap.com. It's, it's a URL that, um, that AirThings uh, operates. And it's, it's, um, you'll find there where you type in your zip code and you can see where, there's, where the devices are and where their areas of risk are. So one thing that we always say is just because uh, your neighbor has high radon levels, um, doesn't mean you are, but it will give you a pretty good indication of where radon levels are are the highest. Uh, next slide, please. So I think this is just overall understanding, you know, through our devices, understanding kind of what's in the air and kind of what puts some context to the application of how these things get in. Um, but we talk about radon and radon is going to emit from the ground. It's going to obviously access the home through foundational cracks going to find its way through if you live in the Midwest and you have basements or sump pumps or any sort of plumbing 
Um, it's a gas that's going to obviously it's going to rise, so it, it finds itself inside of a home, um, and it's a heavier gas. So it's um, when we, as I think as a society, and as Dr. Stephanie alluded to, we have increased um, you know, just better building technology today. But the but the you know, the seal, if you will, the envelope of the home is getting more tight. And I think as a whole, unlike more in Europe, I would say that we tend to circulate our air more than you know offer fresh air uh, intervals that come into obviously to recycle the air. So I think where we have big issues was where you need to take action. Um, so you can see there in, in the case of radon getting in through to the house. Um, we also talk about VOCs. Again, VOCs could be in the form of a toy that you got, you bought at the toy store for your child. It could be in um, new sofa, it could be new rugs. So these things are emitting in the case of the, of the kitchen there. Um, you see, we, we all cook. So it could be nonstick cooking services um, from your cookware. It could be the nonstick sprays. But you know these things we emit, and as we learn more about what VOCs do or volatile organic chemicals, um, it's more important to know that as those levels increase, um, we do something about that. And that would obviously be in introduced uh, fresh air into the environment, um, et cetera. Um, I would also talk about mold risk. So we as a company um, with our sensor technology and our devices have the ability to detect, um, and Dr. Stephanie will provide some context here, but being able to detect, you know, levels of moisture or water inside of a home that present a risk um, of mold growth. So it's not uh, what we call mold risk is not a detection uh, or the ability to detect mold, but it's more about providing the information and the environment that leads to mold growth. So we talk about, you know, when you see it, it's too late. So our devices will provide the proper insights and information that will allow one to take action before uh, mold grows. So this is interesting, Billy, if I might just interject here. A lot of people think that if you humidify your home, say 40 to 60%, that you're going to enhance mold growth. And it's really important to understand that mold cannot extract water vapor out of the air. Mold needs liquid water to grow. So if you humidify your, your home, for example, and you have like poor insulation and you have a cold surface in the middle of the winter encountering humidified air, you, you can reach your dew point temperature and have condensation. But the problem there is not the humidity, the problem is poor insulation in your building. So it's really, really important to understand that humidification is not analogous with mold growth. It's liquid water condensation that you have to watch out for. So I just wanted Thank to, to say that. No, that's uh, good context. So yeah, I think in the last one, was obviously we have there is we have the CO2 and, and the, probably the best example is we kind of go into the fall period and prepare for you know the Thanksgiving season. And hopefully we have we're all fortunate enough to get together with some some family, but when you think about you know a crowded environment um, inside the home. We have relatives and people, and we emit and exhale um, carbon dioxide. It, it's um, you know people have a tendency to get tired, lethargic, uh, can cause headaches, etc. So it's always important to know CO2 levels, and then you know what you can do if those CO2 levels arise to, to ventilate the uh, the environment. Excellent. Um, next slide, please. So yeah, so that's talking about all of the all of the why and why to monitor, and then obviously the what do we do now and how do we do it. So I think in terms of as Dr. Stephanie mentioned, you know that 40 to 60 percent. So how would anyone be able to monitor and maintain that relative humidity level of 40 to 60 percent? But the first thing we would say is is an invest, and it's not a huge investment, but invest in an air quality monitor um, like I have here. Um, so that's the first thing, because that's going to give you the information that you need to, to do. Um, the second thing is, is dependent upon the outputs of the device and what it tells you, um, you take action. So in, 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 the, in the one example here is you want to optimize the humidity levels, which, which Jake is going to uh, provide some, some information on relative to their uh, Condair air products. Um, but ventilation is, is, obvious, is the obvious one. And, and, and it's easier to do when you live in, you know, beautiful, uh, you know, say Southern California right now, but because of the fires, but in areas where the warmer climate markets, it's easier to open up the window and ventilate the home. Um, in the case of radon in, in the Midwest or Northeast areas, 
Um, you know, when you have radon levels above, well, measured in picocuries per liter of air. So when those levels are above two, um, we would say that, you know, you should mitigate, which basically creates a, um, a mitigation system that would exhaust the radon gas below the foundation um, to reduce those levels to, to a safe level, which would be under two picocuries per liter of air. And then in the case of mold, um, we know that that's a, um, you know, very bad thing for a home, um, but obviously to remediate. So when you know that there's mold or, or present in a home is to remediate and remove uh, the mold. Last but not least, the third obvious step is to continue to monitor, right? So if, if, if the environment changes and you, you take action, whether through the form of ventilation, mitigation, or remediation, is the, the environment is always changing. We're always introducing foreign things to the house, we have shifts in the ground, we have shifts in, in the foundations of our homes. So there's always access points and it's always important to stay um, and continue to monitor the same way you do today with a smoke detector. So if you, if, if you don't have a, if there's not a fire that happens or something in your home, you're not gonna get rid of your smoke detector. So we try to encourage people to continuously monitor uh, the air in, in your home. Uh, next slide, please. So we're gonna just kind of highlight the. A couple of products that that that, uh, that we produce and market today that are available. Um, so we have our first product, which is the first smart radon monitor. So this device detects and monitors um, radon gas. It also detects and monitors temperature and humidity. And what we say is maybe similar to a carbon monoxide detector is to place this product in the lowest livable space. So a lot of people say, oh, it's radons only in places where people have basements, but it's really not. It just happens to be where a uh, large, you know, there's high concentrations of radon down in the Midwest. Um, but place it in the lowest livable space, space uh, or the, you know, first floor, and then the coverage area for that is up to 2,000 square feet per floor. Um, the second product, which um, you can continue there. So once you've addressed radon and now you want to address other, um, you know, uh, conditions in the air or other potential contaminants. Um, the, this is a what we call our Wave Plus. So this adds on to um, uh, what the Wave has is radon temperature and humidity, and this adds the ability to monitor and track uh, airborne chemicals in the air, carbon dioxide, and also air pressure. Uh, next slide, please. And then last but not least um, is the what we call our Air Things Wave Mini. So this product was really designed as our first non-radon based product, or the first product that we have without a radon sensor. And this tracks uh, airborne chemicals, uh, so otherwise known as volatile organic chemicals, temperature, humidity. And we also, with this product now, have the ability to track and monitor, uh, provide the insights that um, we, call it, we call it a mold risk indication. So this is the first product um, in the market today that has the ability to not detect mold but to provide the information or the insights that would lead to mold growth and so this is positioned more as a product to go into a bedroom a bathroom uh, a nursery but up to a thousand square feet uh, next one please and then we have a product here that we we package together and this is actually we're going to have some exciting uh announcement at the end that someone will have the i think the opportunity to win one of these but this is basically taking our three of our core products. So core product being a radon monitor for your home. And then we have an air quality monitor with our Wave Mini uh, with mold risk indication. And then we have a device there, what we call the hub, the AirThings hub, which is essentially is your base station. Um, what that allows you to do is all of our products normally communicate from device, like in this case, directly to your phone via Bluetooth. Um, but in this environment, this would give you the ability to add additional uh, products to additional bedrooms and living spaces, and then being able to have remote access to all that information. So if you, you know, you had a larger home or you had uh, maybe a, a summer place or a cottage, you can monitor the, infra the, um, the air quality remotely. Um, so this is a product that we have available in the market today. Uh, addressing really those critical uh, areas with, with mold risk indication and radon. Excellent. So now I'm going to hand it over to you, Jake, um, and talk about your products for optimizing 
your home indoor air. All right, yeah, thanks a lot, Billy. Um, so yeah, thanks a lot for everyone for joining in. Uh, like Erica said, my name is Jake Delosio, and I'm the product manager here at Condair for our residential uh, humidification solutions. Um, so just a brief uh, overview of who we are at Condair. Um, so we are the uh, world leading manufacturer and provider of uh, humidification solutions uh, for health. Um, we have worldwide operations with over 750 employees worldwide. And our headquarters is, in, uh, is located in Switzerland. Um, we've got manufacturing sites uh, here in Ottawa, Canada, uh, as well as in Germany and in China. Um, we've recently launched several new innovative uh, whole home humidification solutions, which we're very excited about and I'm going to be talking to you about. Um, so as a company, we've been you know, very heavily focused and we've been very you know, predominant and present in the commercial and industrial market for a long time. Um, and what we've done now is taken our proven uh, technologies that we've perfected over decades um, and, you know, applied into numerous, um, you know, high-end commercial applications. And we've taken that technology to put it into residential applications, so to humidify your home. Next slide, please. So just one thing I want to talk about uh, real quick before I dive into our solutions. Um, we focus on whole home humidification solutions. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, the portable humidification solutions that you, are readily available, you know, on Walmart or off the shelf um, in other locations. Um, you know, those are uh, okay for humidifying small rooms, um, but we humidify the entire home. So it's very important that all rooms uh, that are occupied within the home are humidified. Um, you know, all the bedrooms, the living spaces, everything. So yeah, that's what we focus on. We you know, like Dr. Taylor said, um, the optimal range is 40 to 60 percent RH, and that's what our focus is, is to maintain 40 to 60 percent throughout the entire home. Um, so just diving into some of our solutions. Uh, so the first one here is uh, the Condor Cumulife, uh, the proven steam solution. So this is the most advanced uh, whole home steam humidifier on the market. Um, it provides pure, clean, atmospheric steam. Uh, to, to humidify the entire home. Like I said, to maintain 40 to 60% throughout all rooms of the home. Um, this system can uh, cover a house up to 5,000 square feet, um, and it's designed to integrate with your uh, home's central furnace system. So um, you can kind of see a diagram over there, um, in the, upper, uh, the upper diagram on the right. Um, you can see how the system uh, integrates with the supplier duct, so it puts the pure, clean steam directly in the duct and that gets distributed throughout the entire home. Um, some of the great features about this product, um, it is a Wi-Fi connected product. Uh, so uh, it allows us to, or the homeowner to control and monitor the device remotely through their phone. So you could be you know, away from your home at work or at the grocery store or wherever um, and you know, monitor your system, make sure everything is working okay. Um, some of the other great features uh, are patented auto adaptive control. Again, that's something that we've uh, perfected over many, many years over in the commercial space um, is applied in this product as well. And essentially what it does is it always monitors the operation and optimizes the energy usage. This product is a completely bundled solution. So it's got all the different components that you need um, for the installation ready to go. Um, another thing that we've redesigned with this product from you know, other steam humidifiers on the market is uh, the maintenance. So it is the absolute easiest maintenance in the market. Um, you don't have to use any tools. You don't need any expertise. You just open the door, uh, change the cylinder, which you, know, you would do maybe once every year or so. Um, and that's all the maintenance involved. So it's a quick uh, you know, couple minute process and, and that's it. Um, and yeah, this product does, uh, the retail price is 825 uh, US dollars. That's the, the starting price. Next slide, please. The next solution I want to talk to you about is the economic solution for forced air heating. Um, so this is a uh, bypass style humidifier or flow through style humidifier. And again, this integrates with uh, a home central furnace system as well. Um, so uh, this covers homes up to 3000 square feet. Um, and again, it provides moisture into the ducts, which gets distributed throughout the entire home. Uh, this device, like the previous one we talked about, um, is also a smart device. Uh, it connects remotely through uh, the Condor Cumulife app, uh, which can, you can have access to on your, your uh, smartphone or tablet remotely anywhere in the world. 
A uh, couple other features with this product. Um, one of them is the water saving mode um, that allows the user to toggle the water saving mode through the app um, and reduce the amount of water usage to the product. Um, another one is the internal sensors, which are constantly monitoring the air temperature that's flowing through the humidifier. Um, and it measures and makes sure that the system is reading an optimal uh, temperature for evaporation. Um, before it'll humidify. So essentially, it just optimizes the water usage. Uh, another great feature with this product uh, is the ceramic media pad. Um, so this is another feature that's completely unique to the industry. Um, there are other bypass style humidifiers out there and all of them operate um, with like a paper mesh uh, or wire mesh type of media pad. Um, and that gets, um, you know, scaled up or, um, you know, full of bacteria over a period of time and you need to constantly replace that, you know, sometimes multiple times per year. Um, so with our system, we've redesigned this. It's a ceramic media pad that um, can be removed very easily from the humidifier and just put the whole cartridge can be, can be put into a standard dishwasher um, and run through a standard dishwasher cycle. Um, so it's very easy. You don't have to continually um, replace these media pads every year. So it's, you know, environmentally friendly as well. Um, so yeah, that's a great feature. And this product uh, also starts at 220 US dollars. Next slide, please. Uh, the final solution that I want to talk to you today is the um, flexible room solution. Um, so this one isn't quite out yet. Um, it's launching later on this year, um, November, December of this year. Um, we're very excited about this product. Um, it's a completely unique product. There's nothing else like it. Um, it's meant for uh, high-end homes and it's completely standalone. Um, it doesn't integrate with the furnace system or with the um, you know, radiant heat system or anything like that. Um, it is a standalone system with a central unit uh, that you can see over in the uh, right upper picture um, that gets mounted discreetly in a mechanical space or in a closet. Um, and then that feeds throughout the ceiling space or throughout the walls, um, individual humidification heads um, that are mounted in the individual rooms that are being humidified. So in the living room, uh, the dining room, all the bedrooms, uh, any living space that wants to be humidified, um, it'll uh, uh, it'll put humidification directly into that room. Uh, those discs that are mounted on the ceiling, uh, you can see on the picture um, to the right on the bottom, um, they're very, very discreet and aesthetic. They blend into the architecture of the space um, and they're very silent as well. So if you have one mounted in your room, you don't have to worry about it disrupting you in your sleep. It's uh, you, basically cannot hear um, any humidity coming out. Um, this product is also uh, also has very low energy consumption. Um, it's a class two product. It operates on very low voltage um, and just city water pressure. So there's no big pumps or anything like that. And so it uh, it's great for you know green building design or passive house design. Um, and another great feature with this product, um, it, you could individually zone each space and have individual humidity uh, humidity control in each room. Um, so say you had a wine cellar, you know, the optimal humidification for a wine cellar is 60% RH, uh, whereas you may want to keep the rest of your house or, you know, your living room or bedroom at 40 to 50% RH. You can individually zone each space to have that control. Um, in addition to that, like our other products, um, it is also a Wi-Fi integrated um, or an internet connected device. And so the homeowner does have control over those individual spaces uh, right from their smartphone. Next slide, please. So where can you find us? Um, you can visit Uh This is our uh, new landing page for everything residential uh, with Condair. Um, it's got lots of great information in this about uh, you know, why humidify for your home. Um, tons of great information on our uh, new humidification solutions. Um, and you can also contact us through the, uh, the website as well. Next slide, please. Uh, in addition to that, you can contact myself directly. So again, uh, Jake Delosio, um, or uh, you can contact either of our business development managers, uh, Tina Hemming or Todd Clark. And so, yeah, that wraps up pretty much everything I had to say about our uh, new residential notification solutions. Um, like I said, please do not hesitate to reach out um, directly to me or any of our other contacts um, and ask any questions that you may have. Okay, so I thank you.
uh, Stephanie and Billy and Jake. So pretty much to recap what you would have learned in this or what you should have learned in this presentation is a physician's view of the human health and the indoor environment, why and how to monitor your indoor air quality and products to op optimize your home and indoor air. Before we move on to the question and answer section, I just wanted to let you know that we may have a few lucky winners in our audience. If you haven't already done so, simply take action and sign the petition for 40 to 60 rhcom If you have signed the petition, you are already eligible to win either an Air Things house kit that Billy had described earlier or a mini Condair hygrometer. The Air Things house kit is a whole home indoor air quality monitoring system which bundles the following the wave smart air dot i'm sorry uh, radon detector the wave mini smart indoor air quality monitor with mold risk indication and the air things hub the condair mini hygrometer is a small hygrometer which is approximately two inches tall that can be placed in any room to monitor the temperature and rh level in that area and now what I would like to do is open this presentation with the few minutes that we have left to address any questions that you might have for our speakers. And it looks like, so this first one could be addressed to any of you. Um, do any of you currently humidify your home? I do. I can speak up. So um, I. I live in northern Vermont, so we have really cold winters, and uh, we I live in an old farmhouse with a wood stove and radiant heat. And starting about three years ago, uh, after a lot of research, I actually selected the Condair unit, uh, the predecessor to the one that Jake talked about, and it's been amazing. So we, my husband and I, we haven't gotten one cold or case of the flu. Um, I, my guitar stays tuned. I can pet my dogs without them getting shocked. But, but mostly it's just super comfortable and we don't get sick. So it's been great. That's a true answer. Great. Okay, I do have one that could either go to Jake or Billy. Can your products sync with other home networking systems? Um, I guess I can uh, just answer that first for uh, Condair's products and then maybe Billy can uh, um, join in too if he wants, but uh, yeah, for. Our uh, Condair uh, Humulife solutions, um, we are currently uh, with development right now uh, to get them uh, be able or have the ability to integrate with uh, Nest or Echo Bee or some of the other major um, whole home you know, smart platform, uh, platforms. Um, so the functionality isn't quite there yet, but it is something that's in our uh, development scope. And like I said before, all of these are Wi-Fi devices, so once they're installed, um, and connected to the Wi-Fi network, we can push that functionality out to the uh, humidifier directly. So it's not like you'd have to go and do some kind of special update to it or upload new software. Um, that functionality gets pushed out uh, right away. Kind of like if your phone goes through a software update, you get those new features immediately. Great. Yeah, and I would say that for us at, uh, at AirThings, we have, you know, this is a little bit more of a technical answer, but there's a there's a technology out there that exists today. It's called IF. Uh, T, 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 it's called if this, then that. Um, so very more more common um, in the smart home community. Um, but with our products, what you could do is you could you could integrate and say, you know, if, if my radon levels uh, rise above two, then do this. And so it's a, it's a rules-based application that allows our products to communicate to other appliances, um, really from a purpose of, you know, doing something uh, based on on what the sensors uh, read. Okay, and I have one last question for Billy. What is the most common indoor air pollutant in the home? I mean, I'd say from a pollutant perspective, the most common would be the the airborne chemicals. Um, just from the standpoint of what we what we bring into the home uh, would be the most common. Um, but I wouldn't say that it's the most critical from a health perspective. Um, you know, I would say that where we've invested heavily is in the monitoring of radon gas, which is a very difficult gas to, to monitor, and it's approximately um, impacts about two thirds of the U.S. or roughly about 82 million households across the U.S. So, um, yeah. 
That's what uh, question on. Okay, great. So, Aaron, can I just say one thing? Of I, course. I would actually uh, propose that dry indoor air is a major pollutant in temperate climates in the wintertime. It's dry indoor air is that harmful to our health. That's, okay. that's my input. Okay. Thank you. So thank you guys. Thanks everybody. So as we're coming to a close, I would like to thank you for participating in our webinar today. If you find that you have further questions, please do not hesitate to reach out